and welcome to episode 26 of Railway Mania. On this podcast, we could be accused of focusing on the technical aspects of rail travel, but here is a story that's a little bit different. With me today is the talented composer and performer, Cheryl B. Engelhart. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Your latest album, The Passenger, is intrinsically linked to trains and railways. Could you explain a little bit about why? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't on purpose ish. <laughs> um, but, but specifically why is uh, because I wrote and produced it entirely on a cross country train trip across America, which is pretty epic. <laughs> yeah, it, it's pretty epic It's the first album of its kind. There have been poetry books and photography books and people have written songs on the album uh, on the train, but not actually turned it into the album while on the train. So I had headphones, I had a little keyboard, uh, everything is sort of synthetic. I did have a few collaborators that uh, I sent from the train, I sent them th- some a bass track and then they, I, uh, Lily Hayden played violin, I had Sangeeta Kaur, uh, she's an amazing Grammy winning opera singer, saying um, some lines on top of it. So they did that at home and sent it back to me while I was on the train. So we got to um, collaborate, but everything you hear that I created on the train is electronic. Technically, I had finished writing it in the first five days. I went from New York to Los Angeles and then I loved it. I was going to fly home, stay with my sister for a few days in Los Angeles and fly home, but I canceled my flight and took the train back because I just loved it so much. So I did a lot of editing and tweaking on the way back. So the whole thing really, I would say, was was done in the nine days that I was on the train. I think uh, replacing the flight for rail travel is music to the ears of a lot of podcast listeners to this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but let yeah. me rewind a little bit. So where did the idea for making an album on a train come from? It came out of a sort of a joke. Um, I was looking to purchase flights to go from New York, where I live, to Los Angeles for to attend the Grammys. Um, so this was December of 2021, and I was looking at flights, and they were so expensive, and I, it was supposed to be the end of January, so I had like a month and a half, and I was like, oh, they're so expensive, I'm just going to take a train. <laughs> and I didn't even know that that was a thing. I love trains. I've toured in Switzerland and Germany on trains, and I live on the Hudson River in New York, and it's like an hour and a half train ride along the Hudson River to New York City, which I take regularly. I, and I've always loved trains. I had a train set when I was a kid, but I didn't have like this obvious obsession with it. It wasn't like I have a hobby and it's trains. Um, but it's not, it's I not me. It's well, not my level of obsession. But yeah, that's why. Exactly. Well, <laughs> but you know, and I had, and you know, my dad and grandfather. They're all engineers, not with trains, but there was this kind of like. I don't know. It's just it was just a, a subconscious kind of love for that kind of travel. It's also the only mode of travel where I do not get nauseous in some way. Like I, I get carsick easily. I was a marine biologist in college, and uh, which you would think I could be on any kind of boat and not get seasick. Not true. <laughs> That's tragic. <laughs> it's very, it's really tragic. Uh, hence the shift to music. But yeah, so I was just like joking about, oh, I should take a train. And then I actually like went down a, a little rabbit hole. I was like, what if I did? And I discovered that there are, you know, there are rooms and there's, there's meals and like this whole sort of culture. And I was like, oh my, oh my gosh, like what an idea. So I ended up booking the train ride out just for my own little bit of a vacation. Um, Early January, they canceled the Grammys. It was like a peak of COVID. So they uh, removed them, I should say, postponed until April. And that same week, uh, one of my best friends who I've collaborated with and wrote a musical with passed away from cancer. That's horrible. It was, yeah, it was really awful and it was exhausting. And it was, you know, it had been like a year of knowing But also it went really fast at the end. And so it was like a year of hope. And I just felt so exhausted and so deflated. And so like, what's the point? Why should I even go? I was I was meant to leave. And I think it was 12 days after I had found out both of those things. Um, I was like, well, now there's no point. But something told me to keep the ticket. I was like, what if I made a record? What if I tried to do some music? And I wasn't planning on doing a record this year because last year and the year before I came out with a new age album each year, both did really well and were on charts and on all these meditation apps. And I was like, great, like I I don't need to do another album. Normally I wait a couple years between album cycles and those two just kind of like popped out easily. But I had this thought and then I couldn't, like the train thing, I couldn't let it go. You know, my father passed away nine years ago and so many people were like, oh, you're a musician, you're going to write so many songs about him. And, and like, zero zero songs i loved him he was my my biggest audience member my my our connection was music he was a jazz bassist like wow. no songs zero <laughs> songs so i was like why would i why do i think that i'm going to suddenly be inspired now after kevin's death and just just, just to confirm kevin was your friend who passed away passed away just a few weeks before 
before I went on this trip, which was just a couple months ago now. So, so yeah, so I, I kind of was like, let's see what happens, you know? So on the train ride itself, you know, I had big emotions. I was dealing with this grief that I, I had never lost a friend my age before. Mm. This was very different. It was very different than losing my father mm. who had been sick for years and years and years. Um, and it was, it's just a different, you know, a partnership and that, that collaborator kind of person. And so I had a lot of big emotions. I had a lot of dreams with him. And then so in the mornings I would get up and I would write, you, you can tell on the album, the songs that I had written in the morning on the train because they're a little more somber. And then throughout the day, just being inspired by the scenery uh, was so you know, one hour you're in planes and cows and then like four hours later there's snow and I mean it was end of January, you know, so and we went through the Rocky Mountains and the Colorado River was frozen like right to the left there. I, I saw like hundreds of elk crossing this frozen Colorado River. Like you just can't like you don't see stuff like that. Amazing. Being inspired by the landscape and by these big emotions, I think those two elements together made it really easy to write this record. Have you ever taken a trip like this before? You said that you've toured on trains before, but have you ever done anything of this length of time or no. distance? No, I have. When I've toured with my band, like performed in a bunch of different cities around Switzerland and Germany, getting through Europe, specifically Switzerland and Germany on trains is so easy. So, you know, we're on a train for three hours, five hours, nine hours, n never overnight. Oh, wow. But oftentimes with a lot of gear and, and you know, you sort of have to get comfortable with trains platforms and reading signs quickly and you know that there's a whole culture even if you're not traveling overnight so i felt like i had this familiarity and ease with traveling on trains but the overnight distance experience was definitely the first for me and a hundred percent not the last yeah and america's not noted for its passenger rail travel really since domestic airlines sort of, and freeways kind of took over in sort of mid-20th right. century Right. So I, 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 was, I was amazed that you could actually do this trip. I wasn't even aware that it was still going on, that you could actually go coast to coast. You, yeah, you can go. There are four main different ways you can go. Most of them from the East Coast, you, you go east about 19 hours and you end up in Chicago and you pretty much have to change in Chicago or if you're coming from the very south, New Orleans. And then from there, there are three or four different routes that go pretty much straight to California. One goes much further north through Glacier National Park, which apparently is beautiful. That's the Empire Builder train and ends up in Seattle. The one I took was just a little south and went across through the Rocky Mountains, ended up in Sacramento, California. And then I took a down the coast of California down to Los Angeles. There's another one, and this is the one I took home, which goes kind of if you were to draw a straight line from Los Angeles to Chicago, it goes through Arizona, a little more desert. I, I, I love the scenery there, but, you know, it was a lot of big red rocks and sort of desert scenery, a lot of flatlands. Um, but it definitely felt like I was looking at it versus being in the Rocky Mountains. I felt like I was part of the scenery. Like I felt like yeah, the, yeah. there are 47 tunnels that we went through. Um, <laughs> the train is and the train tracks and the train it, it is part of the scenery in yeah. in in that particular route which i thought was really really interesting and i'm glad you mentioned 47 tunnels because we have a very tech-centric audience on here so so i want to go through some stats with you so oh so... i can get techie i learned some train stuff yes <laughs> <laughs> so 47 tunnels uh how many days traveling technically it was five days out and then four days back i took the slightly shorter route on the way back and how many times did you have to change trains on the way out, I switched in Chicago, and then I switched in Sacramento, and that's it. Brilliant. And on the, on the way back, uh, I was LA to straight to Chicago. I only switched one time. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So it was technically one, two, three, four, five different trains over the nine days. Yeah, yeah. Talk about scenery. Yeah. Um, how did what you saw and experienced on the journey and the different places you were going through influence the different tracks on the album? Yeah, I, I saw so many birds. Um I saw, and, and in my one of my dreams that I had where Kevin was there, I was like, how am I going to know when you visit me? Uh, and I asked that many times in many dreams. And like the last day, he actually said, well, I'm going to be a bird, of course. <laughs> so that was like the ninth day of the train travel. And I had already seen, I saw like dozens of bald eagles and big vulture type things and t like lots of robins and cardinals and bright colored birds. And I just was really, really touched by all, all of the birds. There's this one track called The Two Feathers. I was going to say had... The Two Feathers. I was going to say, I was literally... Uh, 
my, it's on my notes here. I was going to say the two feathers is really dreamlike. Yeah. And that comes after the Misty Cosmos, which like has quite a sort of dark and brooding tone to it. You totally got it. Two feathers was kind of this idea of just like two souls kind of dancing around. And I mean, completely inspired by birds. I mean, the funny thing about these tracks is there's no lyrics on, on any of them. I mean, there's light lyrics on one track way in the background, but because they don't have words, it's not like the obvious song chorus where it's like I love you baby and then you name the song I love you baby because you hear it 19 times it was really kind of I named all the tracks after the fact um, I actually had my fans help me I sent them a couple snippets from some of the songs and said you know what imagery comes to mind what do you feel um, and th they helped me name the Misty Cosmos actually because I didn't have a name for that oh that's really sweet but the two feathers came to me while I was on the train and that piece came to me when I was going through more of the plains and sort of desert and I love the, the idea of like traditional flute sounds that are really grounded in the earth whether it's from Asia or Native American I just like there are like when you hear a flute it really connects you to nature to me at least um, you hear that a lot in spas and things like that for a yeah. reason. Yeah, definitely. I reached out to Sherry Finzer, who is one of the world class. Like, if you like, ever gone to a spa and heard a flute, she that was probably her playing it. Um, <laughs> and I was so grateful that she said yes to because it was a fast turnaround. I'm like, listen, I'm on a train. Can you wing this and get this back to me? So here's the track that I created, and she played two. She's like, I did a bass flute and an alto flute. Like, pick whichever one you like. And I was like, oh no, I like them both so much. So I, th <laughs> I, it so, sort of just really there was this theme of two. So I felt like I, I would have the two parts that she gave me weave in and out of each other. And so the two feathers, it kind of just... And they dance with each other, just like you're saying, this sort of dance of two people. Two, two yeah, spirits. two souls, two feathers actually like literally falling because, you know, from birds flying around. I, I mean, it could be literal or it could also just be that like... The, you just see this sort of piece with the, the feather falling to the floor. So Amazing. Yeah. And you speak a lot about the Rockies and the epic scenery that you went through there. How did that influence? Um, which tracks did that influence and in, in, in which way? It kind of influenced no tracks because I literally had to take my headphones off and put my computer down <laughs> and just put like my face was that's glued. The, that's the break in the middle of the album. <laughs> yeah, my face was glued to the window. I, I <laughs> cried tears of awe when I when we came around this corner and it just the mountains opened up and we were right in it. Like the photos I have, like, and I'm... I'm so grateful that my my room was on the there are two floors you know you could go upstairs or downstairs for the, in the sleeper cars I was so grateful that my room was on the bottom floor because anytime we had a quick stop where you're allowed to get off for about five minutes and get back on fresh air break I would go out with wet paper towels and wipe my window down so I could have this like <laughs> yes. streak free experience so I I mean I I would say that there are some more epic tracks and and I'm sure that that scenery was like embedded in me somehow musically but it was the one time where I was like. I, I can't be looking at my computer. I knew I had a deadline. I knew I had to just sit down and do the work. But I also was like, yeah, no, I have to be really present. This is well, It's also a top tip to anyone doing that journey is to take uh -huh. paper towels to wipe down the windows. <laughs> yeah, that's a so, total, like so many people were like, oh, you come do mine. Like some of the, the Amtrak workers were like, are we paying you? And I, like all of the jokes. And I'm like, y'all laugh now, but wait till you have streaks on your photos and mine are perfect. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, laugh yeah. it up. But that's, that. yeah, pro tip for sure. Bring a, bring a little towel or washcloth or a little spray bottle of Windex and you'll have a perfect, <laughs> perfect windows. So a lot of your previous work has been centered around piano music and vocals, but yeah. how is The Passenger different to that? Uh, seeing as I definitely didn't want to disturb the other passengers with any live instruments or me singing or anything like that, uh, this was such a departure from me as a piano player who I play, you know, acoustic pianos normally, like real big pianos and I use the piano my record luminary I it's just piano and voice but you'll hear things that sound like violins and and synthesizers because I'm I'm plucking the strings on the piano and tapping and like doing all sorts of stuff like I really use the whole instrument so this was a really going back to my roots when I was studying film scoring music where everything was electronic and you're just using computer sounds and essentially mm -hmm. I had this little teeny tiny keyboard that I could play it was like a piano tiny little piano I would play it if you were just sitting in the room with me, you wouldn't hear anything because I had headphones on. So all of the sound was coming from my computer. So I'd play on the piano, tell my computer, okay, I want that to be this, like a wah, wah, wah synth sound or a kind of cosmic sound, or yeah. I could tell it to be a trumpet or a, a flute. So I would tell it what sound I wanted to be. And then I would hear that back through my headphones. So essentially there was, you, no one could tell I was actually composing any music. If you were just looking at me, um, you couldn't hear anything. So. 
knowing that there was going to be noise on the train and I didn't want to be a source of noise on the train. Uh, it was my first like totally electronic ambient album, which was really exciting. It's a very um, male-led space, so to have composed and produced and I mixed the record myself and my master engineer was a woman and all of the featured artists are women so it was a really it, and it wasn't super on purpose I wasn't trying to like make a huge statement but it was kind of cool to kind of have this different perspective in that genre absolutely and and you said also about you had one compartment to yourself is that right I did yeah they call them roomettes so they have roomettes they have bedrooms which are bigger and then they have like family rooms so basically what it is you walk into this car and it's kind of like harry potter style like there's two seats facing each other mm -hmm. enough for two people so they're just wide enough for one person to face another person little table in between um and at night an attendant comes and turns that bottom chair the two chairs into a bed and then a fold down top bunk so if i had someone else that we could have both slept on two different bunks right right i did learn two nights in that the top bunk the higher you are on the train in general the more wobbly it is right okay yeah because you're further away from the wheels i guess yeah yeah so the, if you're a sensitive sleeper like i am um <laughs> you want to sleep closer to the bottom um uh, and i also learned that the top bunk is two inches narrower than the bottom bunk and i'm like tall and skinny so like i was like i'll be fine but the two inches makes such a difference and the feeling of like i'm not going to fall off yeah so two nights in i was like i wonder if i would sleep better if i slept on the bottom so i just had the attendant make up the bottom bed well at that point i had switched trains so i was able to sort of experiment with a new setup I just had him keep the bed the same. I didn't have him the next day. He came and offered to put it back into two seats. And I was like, I'm just going to sit up like as if I was working, sitting up in bed and spread out a little bit and folded the top bunk up. So I had more headroom and it just felt a little less claustrophobic. And, and that was the way for me to go. I thought I would use the top bunk to put all my stuff on it, but I really, my room was right next to the luggage rack. So I really didn't need to keep all my stuff in my room, which you normally have to do. Yeah, so. yeah that makes that sense. And, and, and they're roommates, so they're quite small and, and, and you're in there on yes. your own. So how did you find that as a creative space to be in? I mean, I kind of looked at, like, I, I, I did a lot of preparation. Uh, I brought an entire duffel bag specifically to really make it a little oasis. So I saw this this Instagram little reel that Amtrak did on their official Amtrak page, which is, you know, the the train company. It was like a, a roomette and then someone did a snap and then it was like there were blankets and like little Christmas lights sort of things. And, and I was like, all right, game on. So I, I brought throw pillows and blankets. I brought little extra lights. I had a candle. I had like some crystals. Like I, I got all new agey with it. And so I had this- <laughs> Very appropriate. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So I, I really, I made it a nice space. I liked being in there a lot. Um, I did go to the, they have an observation car that is for anyone uh, on the mm -hmm. train, whether you're in a sleeper car or in coach. And that's, you know, got the glass sort of all the way up and around the ceiling, Amazing. which was cool. So I did that when it wasn't too crowded. Again, this was like in the peak of uh, one of the COVID peaks. So I, everyone had masks on and it was fine. But when it got too crowded, I just felt like it made more sense to go to the room. And I also went to the dining car, which was only accessible for people that were in the sleepers. Right. And when those weren't too crowded, those were also nice to sit in. Um, but sometimes you could, you know, you could take your meals there or you could have the attendant bring them to you if it was too crowded or there wasn't room. So that was extra special little, it was kind of amazing to travel. Normally travel is so exhausting. Um, yeah. I mean, I treat travel as just like, I just have to get there the fastest way. Like I just have to get it out of the way. Yeah. I don't. I don't necessarily enjoy the journey. I don't really care about enjoying the journey. I just want to get yeah. to the destination as quickly as I can. This is so the opposite. And to mm. to be able to like like I was getting itchy. You know, I work from home. I always have worked from home. So COVID, not COVID. Uh, I have my studio in my house, and I was you know, had just been dealing with my best friend dying. And so I just, I wanted to get out of my skin. I want to get out of my space. I wanted to like feel something new, but I also was so exhausted from all of that. Right. And to be able to just literally, literally sit in your own bed in this room and have people bring you food, but also watch the entire country go by at 80 miles an hour. I, I was like, this is like literally like, like resting while moving. Yeah. And, and I couldn't think of another example. Well, it's a hotel. I guess it's a hotel on wheels, isn't it? Like, like it's a, yes, it's a small room, but you get the best view ever. Yeah, is that like what a cruise is like? Cruises for, have always freaked me out, but maybe that's what the appeal is, where you can kind of rest, but also go somewhere mm. and see things in the in the process. But this, that's probably the closest example. But this was this was that for sure. Amazing.
And then did you get to talk to any of your fellow passengers about your project? And and what did they say if you did? Yeah, so it's so funny because of COVID, I definitely had this like, I'm not interested in talking close to anybody. It, the trains were noisy. You know, there's this constant low rumbling. Um, so you, you, you kind of can't talk at a low volume. You have to really kind of get in there with the conversation. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, having I, I had read ahead of time, like so many people are so inspired by other people's stories and, and so many books and poems and, and even songs have been written about other people's travels, who you come across on trains. But I had my big emotions. I had the scenery. I felt like those two things were enough inspiration for me. And I really felt like I just I wasn't in a space where I wanted to talk to anybody. I really didn't. But I did join a couple Facebook groups, Amtrak fans and train fans and things and sort of shared, hey, I'm doing this. I had created a, a page for people to follow the journey, sign up for my email list, listen to some music and, you know, follow the, the literal little actual train on the map as I was going yeah, um, yeah. on the app I had set up. So, you know, I had posted a little bit and it, I got such a beautiful response from people and someone actually posted on my group like, hey, I think I see you in the observation car with your keyboard. You look really focused. I also have social anxiety. So just know that I wanted to say hi and hi. This is me saying hi. And like there were several people like, I saw you too. So like That's digitally. That's amazing. That's so yeah. sweet. It was so sweet and it was totally perfect. And it was exa exactly what I wanted because I really wouldn't have wanted to have been pulled out of whatever flow I was in. I wouldn't have wanted to like sit and try to have a conversation with masks on with the rumbling. It would have just been frustrating, I think. Mm. But that effort and that's being seen was and me seeing them and writing back and it was you know it was a really lovely interaction um that happened digitally in real life <laughs> it's like wait what yes it did. that's really cool and i also yeah. I'm, I, I'm in awe of the fact that you actually told everybody as you were going along because that really you know you've got a hard deadline yeah uh, and, and then you're publicizing that fact i think that's the thing that would make me the most anxious is just that like, i've got to finish this album so it, it, in that in those terms so it's often said that a deadline focuses the mind mm. you set yourself the challenge of finishing the album on the train um and and that involved getting the train back as well so d did this plan change during the trip and how did, how did you find dealing with that hard deadline of the end of the journey i yeah the, it's a great question the first so I got on the train at five o'clock in the evening mm -hmm. and then I needed to switch in Chicago, you know, 19 hours later. So I guess it was like noon or something the next day. So I, I was like, let's see what I can do in this, just in this first leg, no pressure. And I got three tracks pretty much done in that time. <laughs> so I, I was like, that's all that oh, pent up okay. creativity inside you just yeah. bursting out there. Yeah. Yeah. So right in the first, 24 hours, I knew I was going to be fine. And my definition of the album was the Recording Academy's definition, which was 30 minutes of music or more than five tracks. I was mm -hmm. aiming for seven. I ended up writing 12. There are nine on the record because three of them were just the poops. So, um, which happens, which happens when you're just plowing through. So I, I knew I was going to be fine within 24 hours. So that was really great. It took a lot of pressure off just knowing that I could crank this out and it was coming easily. I mean, I used to work in advertising where it's like, okay, we need this kind of music and we need it yesterday. So I've always been a fast composer. I've always been able to just sit down and write even if I'm not feeling inspired. Like I don't experience writer's blocks. I don't, I mean, there are times when I feel inspired and I have an idea that came out of nowhere, but I'm never scared that I can't sit down and write. So I I, I thought I would be okay. And then in the first you know, 24 hours, I kind of proved myself. Yeah, and smashed that EP on the yeah. first journey. So done. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> e and there really was easy. a moment, there was a moment I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. But then I was like, oh, wait, I have this backlog of, you know, tracks that I've already done. So there were moments when I was like, I can't, I need a break. And, you know, like when I wanted to glue my face to the window to watch the Rockies go by. And, you know, when I saw the ocean in California, like definitely moments where I felt like it was okay to step away from, from the music. Did your plan change during the trip at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when I got off in Chicago, I had this like low grade nausea and I was like, oh, man, I thought I was good on trains. But like it was, you know, my first 19 hours rocking back and forth and I was walking through Chicago and I did not sleep well at all. I'm a light sleeper and the trains honking every hour and the movement and, you know, the dreams with Kevin popping it. Like it was just like a lot. And I so just that exhaustion and and low grade movement nausea. And I thought that the station was like moving. I thought we were in an oh earthquake because it was I, like my body was still like rocking back and forth. Yeah, but the station yeah. wasn't. I was like, oh, this is going to be. I was like, well, I can deal with anything for four days, like no big deal or a day into it. 
And so then I, you know, I boarded the train again. And once I got settled on the California Zephyr, and that's the train that goes through the, the Rockies from Chicago to Sacramento. Um, once I got on that train and really got settled in, that was the longest leg I would be on. I would be on that for three nights and really set my room up as fast as I could. So I could just sit down and be like, all right, drink some water, like what's happening. And within an hour of that, like it all settled and it kind of like mm. all clicked. And I was like, I just had this feeling. I was like, I know I'm going to be done with this album in five, in the five days, but I feel like I'm going to need more time, not for the writing, but for something else, like for this journey, for the processing, for the rest, for the motion. I don't know what, but that, so that's when between Chicago and Denver, when I knew I still had like somewhat reception, that's when I called the airline. I called Amtrak to see if I could get a train back, um, called the airline to cancel the flight, called my sister to make sure she could drive into the train, like all of this, like just dealing with logistics, like anytime there was a stop because, you know, reception is really hard when you're moving that fast to, mm. to keep it solid and Wi-Fi oh, yeah, was not a thing. Yeah. yeah. Communication is difficult. Yeah. The whole plan back changed from Chicago to, to Denver when I was like, I kind of had settled in and was like, I, I see what's here for me, but I don't know what it is yet. And I want to mm -hmm. make sure I give myself enough time to see what it is. And would you say that was those first 24 hours the hardest bit in terms of the journey? Yeah, definitely. Just physically kind of getting used to the space. Um, I think my body was like, hey, what's happening? We're normally cool on trains, but this is like a really extra super long time on this train. So I feel like a little shaky. Are we nauseous? I don't know if we're nauseous. Like, what do we do with food? The food, the east of Chicago is like not great. As soon as you are, get west of Chicago, the dining situation completely changes. So that was a pleasant surprise oh, after, again, time. after yeah. the first 24 hours. So yeah, I would say yeah. the first 24 hours, I was like, mm, I wonder how this is going to go. <laughs> what have I let myself in for? Yeah, yeah. At the same time, I'm like, it's it's only a couple of days. It's a, less than a week. Like, I can handle anything. And then, it, you know, it turned out to be, it'd be a total dream. But, you know, it's interesting because Amtrak came in and Amtrak is a, is a government funded company that came in in 1971, was formed in 1971 to save the dying passenger, private passenger mm. industry. So passenger trains were a big thing. And then, you know, obviously the planes and highways and infrastructure really kind of took over in America. So that's what Amtrak was formed for. And so, you know, on, on the East Coast, going up and down from New York down to, you know, DC, the East, East Corridor, I think they call it, Amtrak actually owns the land that the trains go through. But when you get to the west most of the rest of the company the tracks are owned by freight trains which is still a you know a big booming industry is is freight train movement so you know there are a couple of times you have to wait because the freight trains get right of way because they own the tracks so i have some cool pictures where it's literally a y in the tracks and we're just about to get to where the two sides turn into one track and this huge freight train is just barreling through like you are definitely stopping little passenger train to let us <laughs> get out of my way us, you, know, <laughs> you know the big big barrel like looks like oil barrel sort of black um matte painted they're kind of beautiful against the white snowy mountains in the yeah. background but uh you know and we never had major delays on my train you know you hear all these horror stories and i they make up the time we had a two hour delay and we still ended up at the next station whatever that was pretty much on time it was very impressive to like sit and of course i was like yay the longer we sit the more time i have to write and <laughs> i only went yeah, to the bathroom <laughs> yeah i only went to the bathroom or took showers when we were standing still. I learned that in the first 24 hours too, that I think showering on a moving train should be an Olympic sport. And I'm right, not sure yeah, how yeah. more people don't die, honestly. Okay. <laughs> like, I, like I was like, what is, why would anyone do this when the train is I mean, moving? But now you say that, that's what I really want to try. <laughs> now, oh gosh. Oh no, that's going to come back to me. So many people are going to have concussions because of this podcast. <laughs> I wanted to ask you if you could go back and have one of those days on the train back and do it again, mm. which one would it be? Denver to Sacramento. That's when you go from the plains and then you're climbing and you start going through the tunnels and you start seeing the wildlife and you start being part of that scenery. And you, it's just, you know, I think no matter what side of the train you're on, you're seeing amazing things. It's that everyone, the energy on the train, you can just tell everyone was just so connected with, 
what we were seeing, which was just nature. I mean, the conductor was like, there's a bald eagle ahead. There's a wolf over there. Like, you know, he would get on the, like just everyone, no matter how many times you see that, I feel like you can't get, I just heard it in the conductor's voice. This is his like, what, thousandth time doing this. And it's still like, everybody on our left, we've got a herd of elk. So it's, <laughs> it's I would do that. I definitely, uh, if you told me I had to do that every day for a year, I would do it. Fantastic. Coming to the end of this interview, but I think my personal highlight of the album was the Zephyr Remembers, which has this mm. amazing vocal on it from Zangita Kaur. Mm. Um, but do you have a favourite track from the album? That is, I mean, that's an amazing track simply because of what Sangeeta brings. I, I it's kind of think... haunting and inspiring and, and epic at the mm. same time. And, and yeah, it, it, it just is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. And the Zephyr was the name of that train that went through the Rockies. Mm -hmm. So the, I think also um, that's probably why I liked it as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm very shallow. <laughs> um, I, I think that the first two tracks are really special to me. The Beautiful Bridge, um, which actually was not named because of a bridge I saw. Although a lot of people think that it has to do with, you know, all the many bridges that we went across. Not as many as the tunnels we went through, but oh, um, course, yeah. many, many bridges. But it had nothing to do with the bridges. That was actually one of the few tracks on the album that I named before I even wrote it. And it came out of a conversation that a friend of mine, Lily Hayden, um, who is a Grammy winning new age artist and violin player and vocalist, um, she called me right after she had found out that Kevin had passed away and, and ha had this really lovely conversation about her relationship with her mother who has passed since passed and just how now that you have someone that you love that much in the other realm whatever that is for you you now have this bridge to that other realm and it's she called it a beautiful it's a beautiful bridge and i just love that phrase and i love the sentiment behind it and just like the lightness and you know that she said it with and so when i asked her to play on this piece I, that I had already written on the train, it kind of had a section and then it had this weird departure section musically and then it came back to the first section, almost like that weird little middle section was a bridge. And it just felt all too perfect. And then she gave me this violin track. I asked her to play violin on it because that's what she's world renowned for. And she's also like, I'm gonna do a vocal track too. I just hear, hear a thing. So you hear this haunting ooh ah in the way background and that's her and it just, got a lot of emotions in it and I think it's just one of the most beautiful things I've collaborated on so I would say that one and then the light that le that's left that was the first track I wrote on the entire train trip and it I think it just it has a lot of space which you listen to me talk a lot of my past music is similar like there's I like to put a lot of notes in I I love playing the classical the fast music yeah, yeah. this is like the opposite of that um the light that's left it lingers and there's space and there's feelings um so those two those two pieces really like did exactly what I wanted them to do it sounds like it's an extremely personal journey for you as well which I think is reflected in the album so Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's lovely you shared a few of your tips so just to wrap up do you have any advice for listeners thinking about making a similar journey yes definitely um, this is the first one do it yeah yeah you don't need as much pillows and blankets the the pills and blankets if you take an amtrak cross-country train, train trip are delightful they just redid them all they're not i thought i was going to get like a felt square washcloth to sleep with um but they had really nice so i did not need to bring a whole duffel bag of throw blankets and pillows so save yourself on that they provide you with whatever you need and extras and they're delightful about it two if your train trip is anything besides very point a to point b call someone call like the person that ended up doing my booking I should have named a song after her, Letitia, because she, I was like, I want a room where there's not a lot of foot traffic that's not near a bathroom. And and I think looking at, I, of course, I looked at the uh, the floor plans for all the sleeper cars. Uh, I was like, I think I want room two. She's like, girl, you want room 11. And I was like, okay. And You so, need someone <laughs> with that knowledge. You need somebody who can recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. So she was like totally on my side. So get on the phone, become their friend. If you have a somewhat complicated or you have strange requests and you can't figure out how to do it online, like don't be afraid to get on the phone with them. I'm trying to get Amtrak to use one of these tracks as the hold music, um, but they're not replying to me, so. Well, fingers <laughs> crossed. Uh, where can people buy The Passenger? Thank you so much. CBEmusic.com is my website and it has access to all the places you could buy it, but wherever you love to purchase music, it is there. I got mine from iTunes.
because I'm old school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's on it's on iTunes. Thank you, iTunes, Amazon, Spotify. If you're a stream stream person, but yeah, I, I very much appreciate that. And straight from on my website. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with us your story about you know creativity and an epic journey and such a personal one as well. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. I, I really appreciate this. Thank you.